All right, I just sent out an email to the class um, about 10 minutes ago that says, if I don't cover the end of 13.4, it should have said 13.4, not 13.5, um, that, that uh, there's a video you can watch, it's optional. So basically at the very end of the Green's theorem section, there's this problem that's really cool. And the way you go about it is kind of outside the box thinking and it's the way that mathematicians approach problems. And so it's nothing you would ever be tested on, but I think it's, it's worth seeing. But we need to get through some other material. So my plan is to try and get through 13.5, the first part of 13.6, and if we have 20 minutes left at the end, I will go back and finish up 13.4. If I don't have time, then you can watch that video if you want, okay? All right, so 13.5. We are going to kind of change gears here a little bit. We've been doing line integrals, and what I gave you um, this handout is the formulas for just chapter 13, section two. This is just the formulas that we went through in, for line integrals. So you can, you can look at this yourself. It's line integrals in two-dimensional space over scalar functions. That's the first page and the second page. The third page is line integrals in three-dimensional space. Again, those are, over, uh, those are uh, using scalar functions. That's the third and fourth page. And then the fifth page is the line integrals along, of f along um, c. That's when you're dealing with vector fields, OK? So this is a summary of those formulas. Um, we are going to step away from that for just a little bit, all right? And we are going to address two two vector field operations, which means let's say that we have a vector field and forget any curves through that field or anything. Just, let's just look at the vector field itself. And we are going to define two different operations within that vector field. First one is called curl, second one is called divergence. Now, the, there's a definition for each of these and there's a way of calculating them, but I think it's better if we start off with what curl and divergence mean visually, all right? So um, <clears throat> here's, here, before we begin this, I wanna, want you to think about this. Um, if you uh, are driving out, if you're driving down the road, right, and you roll your window down, you put your arm out, right? You know, you're gonna feel that, right? It's gonna be applying a force to your hand. It's gonna wanna actually turn your body this direction, yes? But if you're on the other side of the car, you put your, this arm out, right? It's going to want to turn you this way. So we can imagine that if you're a point, right, and you put your arm out one window, if there's a force here, it's going to want to, it's want to turn you counterclockwise, right? Um, if there's a force on the other side, so you put both arms out and you have an equal amount of force, then you're not going to, actually, you're, you're not going to turn, are you? You're not going to want to rotate at all. So what I'm going to be using here in this visualization I'm about to put up here is the idea is that you have a point and it has almost like a paddle wheel. Think of it almost like a windmill, I guess. And if we have forces being applied this direction, just that direction, then it's going to want to turn this way, isn't it? Okay, so that's the visual you're about to get. I just want to make sure you're clear with that idea. So. Yeah, exactly. It's, if you have like a, a force on one side that's not equal to the force on the other, then you're going to have some sort of curl, right? Some curling effect. All right. So let's get to the visual on this. All right. This is a pretty, pretty involved little demonstration here. Let me reset this. Why is this so big? Oh, that's why. All right. There it is. Okay, this is what I want. Okay, so we have we have a two-dimensional vector field, and the vector field is in blue here. So this is the origin. Here's my little point, and and these little paddle wheels. I want you to imagine that they're like really, really tiny. Like you're just going to stick this little infinitesimal arm out each side, and then see what happens, right? But so, so we can see it visually, I made them really big, okay? 
So we have, can you tell that all the vectors in the vector field are pointed down? Yeah. Okay. And it looks like as I move away, left or right, like if I move to the right, the vectors get bigger, right? And then the vectors to the left, they get bigger also. And the vector field we're looking at here, just so you know what it is, is the vector field 0, negative x squared. So, so really, the, if you look at the vector field, if you, if you change your y coordinate, does anything change? Look at the, the vector field doesn't even have a y, coord, a y in it, does it? Remember how vector fields work? You give me an x and a y, like give me the point where you're located, plug it in here and then you draw a vector. So like what would, uh, what would this vector field be at the point um, 2, 0? What would the vector be that's spit out here? 0, negative 4, right? Because you're plugging in 2 for x, 0 for y, this is what comes out. So if I move over to 2, 0, it should be a vector that points down and has a length of 4. Understand? So that vector field is independent of y. But curl has to do with what's happening if you look at that as a person standing there. And that's, um, we're going to use, uh, let's use water as, as an example, because I think most people can relate to that. Imagine this is just like a stream. We're looking at, you know, from the top down on this stream that's flowing, right? Now, like a river, okay? And you've got water molecules moving, right? And this is like a very, this is like a stream that's, it doesn't have any depth to it. It's not three-dimensional. So just look at it as like a single sheet of molecules moving, all right? Now we can deal with like a real stream that has three dimensions, but we're not ready for that yet. Okay, so here we got this sheet, they're moving. So here's this little guy's, this little water molecule sitting there. The tendency is, is to move downstream because that's what the way the vector field is flowing. However, if that little molecule were to kind of stick its little arms out, what would be happening with the molecules on the side? So imagine I'm, I'm moving down this stream. If I stick my arms out, the guy to my right, the molecule to my right, is moving a little bit faster than me, right? You can tell from this, because he's got a longer vector. So he's going a little faster than me. So if I put my arm out and we bump, he's going to want to turn me this way, right? The friction between us is going to want to rotate me this way. However, on the other side, I've got another guy who's moving just as fast as the one this way, right? So it's kind of like if I put both arms out, this guy's pushing, this guy's pushing. So I shouldn't, I should just flow, right? I shouldn't be twisting as I go. Does that make sense? So this, this uh, animation I have, it's actually, right now, it's calculating the curl. And that, that wheel is not moving, which means that the curl there is zero. What will happen if I go and instead I pick a water molecule that's over here? I should start doing something, right? Because again, if I'm, I'm, we're all moving down this way, but the guys you know, to my left are moving faster than the guys to my right. So I'm going to start to feel that friction is going to want to turn me this way, isn't it? OK, so let me, let me move my, now it's actually, there it goes. OK, so you see it going? So it's turning. And the calculation we're going to do, we're going to compute the curl. And then we're going to, the curl, when we do it, is going to be a vector. Say, so the curl is a vector. And then we take its magnitude, its length, um, that'll give us um, the, the speed at which we're twisting. OK? Now, here we're turning clockwise, right? And I'm saying that we have a negative curl. So this is a little complicated. You've got the, the vectors pointed in. When you take the curl, you get a vector, and that vector is pointed in one of two directions, in a two-dimensional case. It's either pointed into the board or pointed out at us. All right? So this, if it's pointed into the board, that's called negative curl. Now, you remember the right-hand rule? Fingers curling into your palm. Your thumb is the uh, direction of the, uh, the cross product, right? This, that's the way curl works. So if my rotation is, is this way, my fingers curl this way, then my thumb's pointing like that, then my curl vector is actually into the board. Understand? And that's considered negative curl. Now what will happen if I move this to the other side? Like just slide it along the x to the other side. Now, our, now we've got 
counterclockwise, right? Because these guys are moving faster than these guys. So I'm getting this curling effect. And now if I do right hand rule, right, my fingers curl in the direction of the turning, then the, vec the curl vector is coming out at us. Understand? Question? It's the magnitude, but the negative is, we have to yeah. pay attention to that. Because really, the magnitude of a vector can't be negative. But if it's into the board, we call it negative. If it's out of the board, it's positive. Okay? Is, you said that the rate of the The speed so at which it's turning. It's angular speed? Uh, no, it's not an angular speed. It's not like uh, radians per second or something like that. It's just a measurement of the rate. It's not really related to the angle. You could relate it to the angle. I mean, there is a way to... to like I actually have this, this animation is doing it, I'm, as the curl changes, it's changing the angular speed of that. But it's just for visual representation. I don't want you to think that this actually has like a radian per unit time measure to it always. You could somehow convert it to that, but it doesn't in general. Okay. So now it, what happens if I move a little bit further to the left? It might go a little faster, let's see. And you can see, look at the ca calculation, curls 3.2, right? Move over 3.6, so this should move faster. And you can see it moving faster, right? So what will happen if I move up and down? Shouldn't, shouldn't matter. And you know that both from the visual, visual of the field, but then also because of the, the actual field itself was, was independent of Y. So up and down should not affect anything, right? All right, that's kind of cool. Let's do something else. Let's change the vector field. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's change the vector field to this one instead. Okay, so we've got some weird stuff happening here. We've got vectors that look like they're going straight across. They're really um, long vectors, then they get shorter then they are short and then they get longer, but then over here if you move down, they're gonna move you, wanna move you away, but if you're up here, it's gonna to wanna to move towards. So you've got something that's not as simple as the one we just looked at, right? So for this vector field, we have um, x squared, negative y squared. So the question would be, you know, what's happening if, if you move around in this vector field, like what's the curl at different points? So right now the curl is zero, isn't it? According to my animation, it's zero. Um, let's move to the right. What do you think is going to happen if I move to the right? Think, do you think we're going to get some turning? Well, let's see. Eh, doesn't look like we do. Looks, looks like along the x-axis, nothing, still no curl, right? Now what happens if I move up or down a little bit? Let me go back to the initial settings, hold on. What if I just go straight up, just straight up? Nothing? Nothing. So along the axes, x-axis and y-axis, looks like our curl is zero. But let's go ahead and, and get off the axes. Let's just go to the right a little bit, and let's go up a little bit. Hmm. Still no curl. Hmm. Curl's zero. Interesting. Curl zero. Weird. What's happening here is that these vectors are hitting the wheel, right? And you're getting this, you know, twisting force on this side and twisting force on this side. But the way that the vectors are angled and the way they're hitting, right, is making it so that you're just getting a perfect balance. You're not having any twisting effect, any curling. There's none happening anywhere. I know visually it looks like that, that it would happen, but it's not. Is this okay? This is kind of a, a kind of strange vector field. I mean, it's, it's not a boring vector field, is it? I mean, there's a lot going on here. But still, at every single point, your curl seems to be zero. I wonder if we have a special name for vector fields that are like that. Homogenous. What? What did you say? Homogenous. Oh, homogenous. Oh. It would seem that way, right? Homogenous. They're all the same. 
don't know. Zero. Zero. Um, this is a conservative vector field. This is what a conservative vector field is. If your curl is zero everywhere, you're a conservative vector field. So you remember I said a while back that we have a way of checking whether or not a two-dimensional vector field is conservative, right? You remember that? And then there was a question, you know, like, are we going to have a check for three-dimensional vector fields? That will be the check. The check is, is the curl, if you take the vector field and you calculate its curl, if you get zero, the zero vector, then it is a conservative vector field. Now, I still haven't shown you how to compute the curl, but that's going to be the check. But it has to be everywhere. Everywhere, yes. The zero vector everywhere. Well, you, when you calculate the curl, you'll get the zero vector. And it will, so when I calculate the curl of this vector field, it will have no x's and y's in it. It's just going to be the zero vector. And that means regardless of what x and y we put in, we're going to get zero vector. All right, that's kind of an interesting vector field. A little boring in terms of curl, but at the same time quite interesting that it's not, you know, no turning wheel. Let's go with something a little more interesting. X, Y, X, Y, sine of X, Y. That vector field. Well, I hope this isn't conservative. Nope, we've got some turning going on there, right? It's kind of slow. Move it up here. Oh, look at that. It changed right there. It changed. It was negative. And then I move a little bit up, now it's positive. So right in here somewhere, the wheel starts turning from clockwise to counterclockwise. Let's move it up into this corner. Back to negative. Still negative up here. Ooh, moving, moving pretty fast there, right? Let's move it over. Very slow over there. It is turning. You see it turning? Very slow, 0.12272. Move it down. Got some pretty good curl there. Down here, moving, ooh, that's moving. Okay? All right. That's the idea of curl in two-dimensional space. What about a vector field in three-dimensional space? So now you have a point, <clears throat> right? It's got little paddle wheels, but wait a minute. These paddle wheels need to be everywhere, right? In every direction. So look at your point as like a little ball with little paddle wheels everywhere. And then, you know, what's happening is these molecules around it three-dimensionally are hitting it. Is it moving or not? Is it wanting to turn? I mean, it's moving possibly, but is it twisting as it moves? Understand? And how do you determine if it's positive or negative, right? So let's, let's look at that. It's on the previous page. All right. And I'll preface this with, you know, I, I'm the one who put together all the animations I show here. This was probably the hardest animation that I've, that I've ever had to come up with. And the reason is because I have... I have a vector field in here, okay, and it's, that's a complicated vector field because it's three-dimensional, all right? So you've got vectors everywhere. It's hard to visualize this. Now, I'm going to take that out of there because it just gets in the way, right? I'll explain what was difficult in a minute, but let's, let's understand that there's vectors everywhere. Now, this right here is our point, and I have, I have a couple of things around that point to help us visualize what's happening, and I'm going I'm to erase that point because I want to rotate this. First of all, we have this red kind of line segment that goes through our point. You all see that red line segment? That is the direction of the vector for the vector field. So if I plug this point into the vector field, which is some three-dimensional vector field, I actually don't, I don't, I don't uh, say what it is. Oh, yeah, I do. It's x squared y z comma x y squared z and then x y z squared. Okay, that's the vector field we're looking at here. All right. 
So if I plug, if I plug a point into this, some x, x, y, and z right here, then it's going to give me a vector, isn't it? Yes? That vector is pointed in the direction of this red. Now, it might be pointed the other way, but that red line segment lies in the direction of the vector from the vector field. So that would almost be like which way I'm moving, right? That's the way that that point would be moving. Understand? Okay, so that's the first part of this you need to understand. And then I have this, this yellow disk, okay? And that yellow disk is perpendicular to that red line segment, yeah? So I'm moving in some direction. Let's say I'm moving in this direction. And I've got this disk that is perpendicular. To, what the heck just happened? Ah! All right, put this down. So I've got this disk, I've got this vector, this point I'm headed, right? Like that, so, understand? So as I'm moving in that direction, my curl is gonna be that twisting along that axis. That's the measurement of the curl. Got it? Okay, so right now, my curl is being computed. It's a vector. And then here's the magnitude of the curl. And right now, it should be moving, shouldn't it? Like it something should be moving because my curl is positive. I need to actually press play for this to happen. So you can see, now I have that black thing on the, on the disc, that black segment. That's not the shadow of that red vector. That's actually just so you can see how fast it's turning. So right now, it's moving pretty quick, isn't it? And if I move the point in space, let me just change the z coordinate. The curl is not changing that much, is it? Let me move the y coordinate. Oh, now it's going to move a lot faster, right? Let me press play. I'm going to have to turn it so we can see it, though. There we go. See how fast that's turning? All right, I want to get some negative curl here. We may not get negative curl. No. Okay. All right. So do you get the idea of, of what curl in three-dimensional space is? Particles moving, or you could say water molecules moving. It has a direction that's given to it by the vector field. The mo water molecules around it are somehow creating some sort of frictional force on it that's making it either want to turn or not turn. Now, if at every point your curl is zero, you have a conservative vector field. What do you think the hardest part of me doing this code was? I think you showed it to us in Did I? Yeah. yeah, I may have. The hardest part was drawing that disk. The disk was the hardest part of the whole thing because it's very simple to draw a circle if that circle is, is stuck on the xy plane or if that circle is stuck on the yz plane or on the xz plane, right? If it's on the flat, um, if it's on a flat surface on the ground or on one of the walls, it's easy to draw the circle because you could just use like r cosine theta or r sine theta or something like that and just draw your little circle. You can move it around, that's no big deal. But what happens when that's actually just sitting in some arbitrary space and it has to run perpendicular to some other line and that can change as you move through the space. So that circle is being drawn but it depends on what that that uh, vector field vector is. That is somewhat difficult to do but you can do it with matrices. You can do transformations and turns. You can turn your space around. So it's just not clean. It's a little bit complicated. All right. Everyone kind of understand the idea of curl visually. Yes? Okay. All right. Let's see how you compute it by hand. There it is. It looks worse than it is, all right? So if you are given a vector field, and in, in what you can see there, that vector field P, uh, is given by PQR. This is a three-dimensional vector field, isn't it? Three-dimensional? 
then to compute the curl, you will do this computation. You take the partial of r with respect to y, subtract partial of q with respect to z. That's your first component. Then you do partial p with respect to z minus partial r with respect to x. Take that component, and then the next, last component of the curl vector is partial of q with respect to x minus partial of p with respect to y. Do you recognize that? That last component, do you recognize that? That's from Green's theorem, isn't it? Isn't that that part of Green's theorem? Also, isn't this what we check for conservative vector fields on two-dimensional vector fields? We see if these two are equal to each other, all right? Partial of q with respect to x, is it equal to partial of p with respect to y? That's the check we do, right? Somehow, this component here is connected to that test we did earlier for conservative vector fields, and it's related to Green's theorem. Just pointing that out. Now this is hard to remember, right? This is a difficult thing to remember. So we have a shorthand notation, a way of remembering it that we don't have to actually have that formula like burned into our brain. We can have a shorter formula burned into our brain and then just do the computation. And here is the formula. The curl of F is, what? It's an upside down triangle crossed with F, right? F is our vector field. Now what's this upside down triangle? It's notation. This is just notation. This is actually del, D-E-L, del. So del is equal to this thing. And I'm going to write it down up here because this is interesting. This is probably the first time you've seen this before. Every time we've talked about a vector before, right? When we've talked about vectors, these components within the vector were either numbers, right, numbers, or functions, like x's and y's or z's or something like that. This del vector is actually, it's, it's not a number and it's not functions. They're, these are operations. So you know how we use the notation? Take the derivative with respect to x of, and then we put something in here like sine x. And that just means, oh, cosine x, right? But this d dx is telling you you need to do the operation of differentiation. When we have this del vector, this is telling you, hey, look, this is the operation that you're going to do. It's weird. We haven't seen this before. These are called differential operators. Okay, this is a differential operator as opposed to a number or a function. And I'm going to show you how it works. Um, we're going to go through a problem and do it by hand. But let's just, let's just see how awesome that short notation is. So do you remember how we do cross products? If you do cross product of two vectors, the way I did it in class is I put the first vector here, the second vector here, and then this was i, j, k. And I usually did not write the i, j, k up here, right? And then what we did to get the actual cross product is we covered up the first column, the i column, right? If we want to get the i component. And then what do we do here on those? The determinant, right? We did that. This times this minus this times this, right? OK, so I'm supposed to do this times this. Now, that's actually not multiplication. That's what I'm saying. This is the difference. You're not saying partial, of, uh, partial with respect to y times r. You're saying partial with respect to y of r, right? That's this piece. Minus partial with respect to z of q. That goes here. And then you, you go and you move on to the j, right? And then here you're supposed to do partial with respect to x of r minus partial with respect to z of p, right? But it's the J, so you switch them, right? That you change the signs. And that's why the middle one looks like this. And then to get the K, cover this up, just do your determinant. So it's, you're actually doing operations. You're not doing multiplication in the cross product. Got it? So that just, I think by doing it this way, it's easier to remember, right? What's the cross product of a vector field? Well, it's del cross f. 
What's del? It's just the differential operators, x, y, and z, respectively. Now let's see it, uh, let's see it in action. Let's actually do an example. Let's start with the three-dimensional one we had before. So find the curl of the vector field, blah, blah. There it is. So I'm going to do del cross f, which is equal to, let's see, the cross product. I'm going to do, I'm going to write down the vector. It's x squared y. No, I'm doing this wrong. This is the partial first. Partial with respect to x partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z. That's del, right? That's the first vector, del. And I'm going, to, I'm going to put my second vector in there. The second vector is the vector field. Now, I should have given myself a little more room because that vector field is pretty nasty looking. So we, should have, we would have had x squared y, z, x, y squared z, and x, y, z squared. So we're doing the cross product here. <clears throat> well, we got what's this first part? We're going to Cover this up, right? We're going to do the partial with respect to y of this, which is just xz squared minus, now covering this up, partial with respect to z of this, xy squared. Is that to let me know I got it right? <laughs> Thank you. Ding. All right, now the middle one, right? So I cover up this. And I'm supposed to go this one, this one, minus this one, this one, but then change the signs. But I'm going to do it the other way. I'm going to do this, this, minus this, this, which will be the same thing. So partial with respect to z of this is x squared y. And then what? Minus, I'm doing partial with respect to x of this, so y z squared. And then last one, I cover up this one and then do my determinant there. So what do I have? y squared z minus x squared z. There it is. That's your vector field. That's your, uh, sorry, that's your curl, right? So this gives you a vector. Now you have to provide it the x, the y, and the z coordinate of the point you're at in, in the vector field. Notice this is not the zero vector. So this is not a conservative vector field. Now, it's, it asks to find the curl and the magnitude of the curl at the point 2, 1, 0. So the curl of the vector field F at the point 2, 1, 0 is plugging in 2 for x, 1 for y, 0 for z. So when I plug in 0 for z, that last, this last one's gone, isn't it? Okay, so I know that last component is zero. And then just here we plug in two for x and one for y, and then that's gone. So what, four? And then here, this one's gone, right, because z is zero. And I just do negative two. Okay, now, magnitude of the curl. The magnitude of the curl of F at the point 2, 1, 0 is equal to the square root of these components add, uh, squared and added up. So uh, 4 plus 16, which is root 20. That number right there gives you some sort of measurement on how fast you're, you're curling, twisting. 
The bigger the number, the faster it is. Yes? Is there a way for us to see whether it's like positive or negative? Well, do we really understand what positive and negative is now? Well, with two dimensions, but like in two dimensions. With two dimensions, okay, so the question is this. In three dimensions, we really don't have a concept of positive and negative rotation. Because in three dimensions, it's all about perspective. So like, you know, if I have my little vector here, I've got my little disk that's turning, right, like this. Then if it's turning this way, to you, you're seeing it, right, and that looks like counterclockwise, right? But to me, on this side, it looks clockwise. So what's positive, what's negative? And this vector is changing, so we really do lose the whole idea of positive and negative in three-dimensional space. Your question is about two-dimensional space. Is there a way for us to know, right, whether or not it's that clockwise or counterclockwise? The answer is yes. The next example is the two-dimensional example. And it's specifically so we can address that question. So, good question. All right, everyone clear on this? Okay, the next one is to find the curl of F, and that is the first vector field I gave you. Remember that one, zero negative x squared? That was the one where the vectors were really long on the outsides, and they got shorter towards the middle. So, the first thing you should realize is that this is not a three-dimensional vector field. And curl is a cross product, and cross products require three-dimensional vectors. So what we do is we extend this vector field into three-dimensional space. We basically add a z co component, which is zero. And if we do that, then we, we can do all the computations. So first thing, we rewrite f as a three-dimensional vector field and we leave the first two component functions alone and we add to it, this is our additional piece, we add the zero, well, we don't add that one. We add zero here so that now it is a three-dimensional vector field. <clears throat> All right, let's do our del cross F. So we have the differential operator, that goes first. Doesn't that just sound like a fancy word? Like differential operators? You can also look at a differential operator is actually falls into a broader class of things called functional operators. Functional operators are things that operate on functions. Differentiation is an example of a, func a functional operator. Integration is an example of a functional operator. And we call this a differential operator because it is a functional operator, but it's, it's doing the derivative. So we call it a differential operator. All right, I'm getting off topic. This is a vector. All right, here we go. Boy, there's a lots of zeros in here, isn't there? Mm -hmm. In fact, this zero is always here, isn't it? If we go from a two-dimensional vector field, actually, I'm going to put that one in blue. If we go from a two-dimensional vector field and we, can, and we extend it out into three dimensions, that one's always going to be zero, right? And I want us to notice that when we do this cross product, what that zero has as an effect here, all right? So let's see here. When we do this one right here, what do we get here? Zero, take away zero. So that's just zero, right? Yes? Okay, that's zero. All right, the middle one, to do this middle one here, cover this up, I do this one and this one minus this one and this one. So remember, you have to account for the change in the sign. So this, this would be zero, and then this and this would be zero. So I get... I'm going to write here 0 and then minus, I know it's 0, but I'm doing this for a reason. Okay. Yeah? And then what about the last one here? Negative 2x. Negative 2x. Right, negative 2x and then minus 0. Okay.
I should have put something here. Let me see. I, you know what? I want to do it this way. I don't think this illustrated what I wanted it to illustrate. Let me, let me start this over. OK. Can we start over? Because I really want to point something out. All right, when we do this the first time, we cover this up, right? And then we do this, this derivative. That's always going to be what? Zero. zero. Always, because that's always zero. When I do this and this, what? Why is it always zero? Regardless of this, change the vector function to something else. Anything you want. Because there's no z there. Look, if the original vector field came from two-dimensional, it only has x's and y's in it, right? This will never have a z in it, so this will always be zero. Understand? Okay, so this piece is always zero, regardless of the vector field. I'm going to have to pay for that writing in red here. That's always zero. Let's see what happens when we do the middle one. Okay, what would that first one be? Zero always, because the blue is always zero. What about this and this? Again, with respect to z, this is the first piece, but the first piece only has x's and y's, which means zero always. OK, now the last piece here, now you've got partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y. That could be different values, right? So this could be something, I don't know what it is, but it could be something other than zero, right? What can we say about this vector? If your first two components are zero, and your z component is something, it's pointed, like remember, the original vector field was two-dimensional, right? That was like your, your x and your y plane. But your answer, your curl vector, is, is three-dimensional, but it's along the z. It's, it's parallel to the z-axis, which means it's either going to point into the page or out of the page. In this case, which, which way does our z-axis come here? If, on this, if I write my xy plane, if I make that three-dimensional, where's the z? It comes out at us, right? Like this? That's what it would look like? Right-hand rule? Like that? So if I get this answer here, right? Then you can see that if x is positive, where's my curl vector, or what's my curl vector going to be doing? Into the board. If x is positive. I think this is answering your question right now. If x is positive, so if I move to the right, my curl, is going, my curl vector is going to go into the board. Yes? And the length of it, the length of it will be how fast it turns. So into the board means we're going to be right-hand rule like this. It's going to turn like this way into the board. Then if I would use a negative x value, slide this way, now the curl vector is coming out at us because it's positive. This is a positive um, number. So then it's going to be right-hand rule. It's going to be turning like this out into the board. Make sense? Clockwise over here, counterclockwise over here. Are we good? OK. So what is, what is the magnitude of this curl vector? Absolute value of this squared plus this squared plus this squared, which is just, I mean, yeah, absolute value of 2x. The square root of, you could say the square root of 4x squared. All right. So if you have a two-dimensional vector field, your curl vector is always a vector that goes into the board or, or into your paper or out of your paper. Y yes, yes, first, I don't know. What do you got? So it's essentially the normal vector of that plane? It is the normal vector. It is, it is a vector that is normal to the xy plane, yes. Uh huh. When you have the xy plane, you have an infinite number of normal vectors. You change their lengths and directions as long as they're perpendicular to the plane itself. All right, pretty cool. We already did that. All right, some, some more definitions here. Some other results of curl. Curl vector creates um, an axis of rotation. So the curl vector creates an axis of rotation. 
and the magnitude of the curl gives us the speed of the uh, rotation about that point. If the vector field represents the velocity field of a flowing fluid, this is, has to do with like um, fluid dynamics, velocity fields of a flowing fluid, then the curl measures the ten tendency of the fluid to rotate or curl at uh, given points in the fluid. So I'm giving you a specific example of how we could use curl and some language used when we do that. If the curl of the vector field is zero, then there is no rotation and the field is called irrotational. So if you have an irrotational vector field, it's because the curl is zero everywhere within the field. Same, what do you mean? Yes, you would say that. Uh -huh. um, if your vector field is two-dimensional, then we can extend it into R3 and we will, um, we will just replace that last component with zero. So this is just re recapping what we just did. Now, uh, the theorem. The theorem that we use for checking if a vector field is conservative. Remember this one. This is what we do to check if a two-dimensional vector field is conservative. Right? Do you see why now? That's right. In a two-dimensional vector field, when you do the curl, the only thing that ever pops up is that z part, right? And so for the curl to be zero, that last part would have to be zero. The, the first two components are always zero. So what would it take to make that last component zero? Well, it would require that the partial of q with respect to x minus the partial of p with respect to y is equal to zero, which means they have to be equal to each other. That's the condition. So we were actually stealing this when we used it before. We were stealing this from this. But <clears throat> the conditions for a vector field in three-dimensional space to be um, conservative is that if the curl is zero, then f is a conservative vector field. Now, this is very important that you understand something here. If I have a conservative vector field, okay, so somebody gives me a conservative vector field, is the curl zero? No? What does the theorem say? It's not both ways. Okay, this, you have to understand theorems here and the way if and then statements work, right? If I give you a vector field and, I, and we calculate the curl and it's zero, that is a conservative vector field. That's what the theorem says. However, I can still give you a conservative vector field where you compute the curl and it's not zero. It is possible to have a conservative vector field that does not have a curl zero. What does it mean to be a conservative vector field? Don't say curl is zero because that, does not, that's not, that is not a necessary condition for you to be conservative. No, it has to do, what was the definition of a conservative vector field? F, F was conservative is conservative If, what, there exists a little f. This is the mathematical symbol for ex there exists. There exists a little f such that the gradient of little f is equal to capital F. That's what it means to be conservative. There just has to be this little f. What did we call that little f? There was a name for it. If, if, if you did the partial of the potential function. So, if, if I give you a vector field, to say it's conservative means that there is a potential function that generates it when you take its gradient. That the gradient of that scalar function f creates the vector field. That's what it means to be conservative. However, if you take the curl of that vector field and get zero, then you're guaranteed that it's conservative. You're guaranteed the existence of a potential function. But just because a vector field has a potential function does not guarantee that the curl is zero. 
So this is an important theorem that, that you understand that it's not an if and only if. It does not go both directions. Okay? But for us, it's good enough because we are given vector fields and we're asked to check, right? Is it conservative? And we have a quick check for it if it's conservative. Because if the curl is zero, then it has to be conservative. Uh, no, okay. So if I give you a, fung a vector field and I ask you, is it conservative, right? Then you just do this check. You check the curl, right? If the curl is zero, it's conservative. Okay, let me try and draw this with a picture. Here is, here is the group of all conservative vector fields F. Okay? There they all are. All of them live in this little world. Within this world, there are the ones that have a curl a curl, kolf, I don't know what a kolf is, a curl of the vector field is zero. So if you take any vector field in here and you take its curl, you're going to get zero, right? So if the curl is zero, then you must be living in this world. You're asking me this. You're, I think you're talking about, what about a vector field right here? Like, what about that guy right there? Right? You, yeah, to go back and try and get little, little f, to recover little f, yes. Okay, so that, that would be the next step to see if it's Yes, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't give you one like that. You know, I wouldn't give you one where it's like, hey, curl, you know, curl's not zero, but it's still conservative. All right, let's move on. Because we haven't even talked about divergence yet. So if curl is this weird thing that gives us like this twisting effect, then what the heck is divergence? Let's start with the computation, all right? And then I'll show you the visual. All right. The div, if you're given a three-dimensional vector field, okay, PQR, and the partial derivatives exist, then the divergence of F is defined to be this right here. Now, this is, divergence is super easy to calculate. I mean, there's like, there's no cross product or anything. And the easiest way to remember it, I think, is this formula right here. Because it's related to curl. Curl was del cross F, wasn't it? And divergence, which we call, which we notate div F, is del dot F. So watch, if I take del, dot it with f, what this really means is the partial operator dotted with f, f is p, what? p, q, r, right? That's our vector field. And if I dot this, dot products is usually this times this plus this times this plus this times this, right? This time it's not multiplication, it's operation. So partial with respect to x of p plus partial with respect to y of q plus partial with respect to z of r. And that's what this is, right? Doesn't that look really, really clean and nice? We're going to use this divergence later on with the last section of this class. And it's just like, it's just mind blowing. This last theorem, 13.9, is just like, whoa. It makes some really hard problems easy, but it requires the div. But the computation's easy. 
All right, so that's the computation of div. You comfortable with that? Makes sense? I mean, we'll have to do an example, but what does div mean? Like, what's it, what is its meaning? It's going to spit out a vector or a number? What does this spit out? It's going to spit out a number. Because look, this is just something plus something plus something. It's a scalar. I should say it's going to spit out a scalar. The curl spit out a vector. This is going to spit out a scalar. It might, it's probably going to be a scalar function of x, y, and z. But it's scalar, no, no uh, components. What is it? Where's my picture? There it is. I'll do the two-dimensional one first. All right, I like div. Div is pretty cool. So look, that vector field look familiar? We had that earlier. OK, so we have a point. This time, I don't want you to think about I don't want you to think about paddle wheels coming out of this point. I want you to think about you have a point, and you're just going to look inside what we call a little epsilon ball. So imagine this is a little circle with a radius that's super tiny, which we usually, when we talk about tiny numbers, we usually like to um, use epsilon greater than zero. So this is epsilon right here. We have this little tiny little, little disk, right? Right, so you take that, and, st and then you start looking at all the points around this disk, and you start drawing the vector field at each of those points. So you pick a point here, you draw the vector field. Um, you pick a point here, the vector field might be a little bit longer, right? Understand? So would you agree that if I'm drawing these, it looks like those vectors are coming out of that little disk, out of that little circle, right? Are there any that would go into the circle? The ones where? Up at the top? These are going to go into the circle, yes? The ones that go into the circle is considered to be negative. The ones coming out of the circle are considered to be positive. With me? If we add them up, then we want to, what we really want to know is, is there more going into the circle or more coming out of the circle? That's what, we were tr that's what div is trying to calculate. Is there more going in than coming out? So would you like to see it? Let's take a look. My computer is calculating it for me. It's taking samples. It's taking samples of points around here. Let me get some of the points out of here. There's too many of them. There. It's taken a couple of points here, a couple of points here. It's calculating the, the, the actual vector field. If it's going in, then it's considered uh, negative. It's coming out, it's considered positive. I have it um, in color coded here, right? Yes? So doesn't it look like there's about the equal amount going in and out? Yes? So the div here should probably be zero, which it is. It's computing that for me. Now, what will happen if I move to the right? Remember what happened with curl, right? Curl, this thing started, the paddle started turning, didn't it? But that's not what this is calculating. It's calculating how many are going in, how many are going out. So as I move this to the right, watch what happens. Hmm. The vectors got longer on the right side of this little circle. Red ones got longer, but so did the green ones, right? And let me put more vectors in there so you can really get a feel for what's happening here. So if you do it like that, doesn't, and I'll zoom in a little bit so we can see it. Doesn't that kind of look like there's an equal number going in than there is going out? Well, it is. The div is still zero. Yeah? Is it ever going to be something other than zero? I mean, in this vector field. Look at that. Looks like it's always zero. Yeah, that's kind of cool, right? It's cool. Come on. <laughs> All right. All right, so now let's, uh, let's change the vector field, because that, that seems kind of boring. Div is always zero, right? Was curl always zero here? No, not in this vector field. The other vector field we did was this one, and that one was conservative, wasn't it? Because the, the curl was always zero. Do you think the div's always going to be zero? Let's see, let's bring in... And I can make the circle a little bigger if it helps us see it. Just remember, that's like an infinitesimal little point. But I'm only zooming into it so we can see it, right? 